Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jeremy Collins. I'm the director of conferences and symposia here at the National World War II Museum. It's a pleasure to have you all viewing with us today. Uh, we've got a great conversation in store, and it's a uh, apropos time to be doing it that Dr. Satino will be referencing in his introductory remarks. Uh, for those of you watching on Facebook, you can engage with our panelists by writing your questions in the comment section, and we will do our best to get to as many of them as we can during the Q&A portion, which will follow the conversation between Dr. Rob Satino and Dr. Sean McMeekin. Rob is our executive director of the Museum's Institute for the Study for War and Democracy, and he is also the Museum Samuel Zamuri Stone Senior Historian, great guy, author of 10 books, and uh, probably the best person on campus or the world to be interviewing today's author. So Rob, take it away. Thanks very much, Jeremy. These, uh, these introductions get better all the time. I really do appreciate that. Um, in the uh, interest of full disclosure, here we are absolutely live uh, as the, the album title by The Doors, which I hope many of you remember from the past. Uh, and um, I'm in my apartment and the powers that be here decided to begin running a fire drill test. So um, an alarm went off a few moments ago. And if it happens again, I'm just warning everyone in advance. I'll, I'll be swift onto the mute button and we'll hand things over to Jeremy to probably continue the questioning as long as the uh, alarm is going on. So I just wanted to get rid of that at the beginning. Um, our guest today, uh, it, it's a real treat. Uh, Dr. Sean McNeekin is the Francis Flournoy Professor of European History and Culture at Bard University. He is the author of, of numerous uh, books, award-winning books, including The Russian Revolution, July 1914, and The Ottoman Endgame. I, I, uh, I did notice, uh, Sean, that one of your books has won the Barbara Yelovich Prize. And I mentioned that only because Barbara Yelovich was my doctoral advisor at Indiana University. And in that way that there's, a, it's a relatively small band of brothers and sisters who do this for a living. And I sometimes think we're all linked to one another in ways more deeply than we can even imagine. So it's really good to have you on the program today. Uh, well, thanks so much for that kind introduction, Rob. Very small world, in fact. I'm <clears throat> currently on the Yelovich Prize Committee. And so we're, we're plowing through about 21 books that have been nominated for this year's prize. Even fact, better. <laughs> we're in the that, middle of a conversation about that very subject uh, today. Yeah. So very, very yeah. apropos. Yeah. So this is the, um, uh, the day after the 80th anniversary of the Soviet, uh, a German invasion of the Soviet Union, Operation Barbarossa. And uh, mo most to the point, uh, Sean is also the author of Stalin's War, a new history of World War II. And let me back that up. That is, that's more than uh, advertising uh, palaver here. That is the real story. This is a very, very unusual book, Sean. And I would say it's been a while since a book on World War II has generated as much discussion and, and I would say controversy as, as this one has. For the benefit of our audience who have not yet purchased, but hopefully will purchase after they uh, hear our, our hour together. You center the entire narrative of World War II, not in the typical way. It's not about Berlin. It's not about what's happening in London or Washington so much. It's really what's happening in Moscow and, and how Joseph Stalin is perceiving events, directing them and reacting to them. Uh, so let me ask the basic question. How does centering the story, the narrative on Stalin change the way we've been seeing World uh, well, thanks for the great question, Rob, and thanks for having me, and uh, thanks to Jeremy. Um, no, I think I should maybe uh, begin a little bit also by explaining kind of what the book is and what it's not. I mean, obviously, the title, once you add the subtitle, New History of World War II, it does become a bit more ambitious, and I'm always in kind of dialogue with my publishers about these things, um, potentially, of course, getting me into hot water and <laughs> claiming larger things than I might have meant to Claim. But that said, I, I shouldn't deny that I am trying to make a claim here, that I am trying to make a kind of intervention into the historiography of the war, claiming that Stalin was far more central to the story than I think has traditionally been acknowledged. Um, some of it is just because of what I call the, the hypermnesia, just almost this uh, almost excessive amount of verbiage and ink, which has been devoted to all, all things Nazi German, all things Hitler, that is to say, just this is the way that the story has been told for, for 70 years. You know, it's always about Hitler, it's always about the Nazis, it's always about these German moves on the chessboards, and then the kind of somewhat belated you know, appeasement, and then the belated awakening of the Western powers to them. I think by looking at Stalin and looking at the, at, at the Soviet foreign policy perspective, one begins to understand something about the way the war broke out, when it did, and why it did, when it did. 
Um, I have written another book uh, about the origins of the First World War, of the Russian origins, where I looked again at a similar question in 1914. Um, and to some extent, the business is easily caricatured. One can say, oh, well, you're blaming it all on Stalin, or in the case of 14, you're blaming it all on Russia. Of course, that's not really what I'm trying to do. What I am trying to do is say that the actual way in which the war broke out was not necessarily in the German interest, or that is, it was not the war that Hitler himself would have liked to bring about or to plan. That is to say, Hitler becoming embroiled with the Western powers over Poland, obviously invading Poland, but then also getting embroiled with the Western powers, was not really Hitler's desired scenario. It was pretty darn close to Stalin's desired scenario. You even go back about a year before, there's another thing that I point out in the introduction of the book, uh, even this, this partition of Poland, everyone knows about the molotov ribbentrop Pact, they maybe don't know all of the details, but the very idea of partitioning Poland was in fact either Stalin's, or that is to say the idea of Stalin and his foreign policy advisors, that is to say they almost proposed this, almost a kind of a trial balloon, first through back channels and then more and more overtly through correspondence uh, with their German counterparts. Uh, the Soviets had an active border dispute with Poland dating back to 1920. They had fought a war with Poland in 1920. In fact, for a lot of the 1930s, from 34 to 39, Poland and Nazi Germany were effectively allies, and they'd even participated briefly in the carve up of Czechoslovakia after the notorious Munich Conference of 38. So part of the story is also that it was not inevitable that the war would break out when it did, or how it did, um, but that the way it did break out was actually very close to Stalin's ideal scenario. That is to say, by signing this pact with the Germans, it was quite clear kind of what the intention was. He didn't know exactly what would happen when the Germans invaded. He was hoping that Britain and France would declare war, and he was hoping that there would be a, a kind of a devastating war of attrition between Germany and the Western powers, this kind of split capitalist world. It maybe didn't happen exactly the way he wanted, in part because the Germans routed everyone so quickly. And, and by 1941, really, the Germans had kind of barely been really kind of scathed on the battlefield. And, and so it, it ended up actually nearly backfiring. But that is to say, the way the war broke out in Europe, um, and to some extent also Asia, which we can get to you know, a little bit later, uh, the way the Soviets kind of stayed neutral opportunistically as long as possible, and then made their intervention at the most ideal possible moment. Uh, you know, these were very deliberate choices um, that nearly all went Stalin's way, not quite all of them. As I said, I mean, Hitler nearly upended all of the plans, first by routing all of his opponents in Europe, and then by turning the tables and, of course, invading the Soviet Union before the Soviets were ready. Uh, but the way the war did break out, and, and certainly at least in the early stages of the Moscow Pact, everything was absolutely going Stalin's way. That's, that's fascinating. The, the, the standard narrative, of course, is that this is all being generated by Berlin and Hitler is getting increasingly frantic because he's got a date by which he has to invade Poland and he, and he has to have his rear secure about that. So he's frantically reaching out. Stalin's being wooed by both sides. You, you return a great deal of agency to Stalin. You say it was Stalin who was reaching out to, or Stalin, the Stalinist regime that was reaching out to Hitler's Germany, realizing that, that war was in the air and, and, and wanting to stay out of it, but really wishing to embroil uh, uh, Germany with a, a, a war with the West. Well, I think that's right. I mean, you know, Stalin was reasonably subtle about this. Not always, though. I mean, the, what I call the chestnut speech, this is when Stalin basically says back in March 39, you know, we're not going to allow the Western powers to drag us into this war, have others, as the metaphor goes, have others pull the chestnuts out of the fire for them. That's a signal. And the Germans actually mentioned this speech uh, while they're negotiating the Moscow back to Malta. That is, they noticed it. It was a signal. Uh, then the sacking of Litvinov, the Jewish foreign affairs commissar, he had actually already been demoted from the European desk long before May 1939. That is to say, he'd already been somewhat kind of demoted and removed from the equation. The man who, if anyone, stood for a kind of more broadly anti-fascist, anti-German foreign policy, who at least talked about collective security, however sincerely he meant it, where Stalin himself never talked about collective security, nor did Molotov. But when he gets sacked and replaced by Molotov, and Stalin literally orders them to sack the foreign ministry of Jews, this is a fairly obvious signal to the Germans, and the Germans pick up on it right away. I mean, Hitler immediately tells Goebbels, his kind of press, his version of the commissar, I suppose you might say, his press chief, uh, cease your attacks on the Soviet Union. I mean, it's, it's, it's not terrifically subtle. It's a pretty clear signal that Stalin wants to negotiate. And while I think the Western powers had some vague notion that something was up when Molotov replaced Litvinov, I don't think they took it seriously enough. I don't think they really perceived the danger. 
uh, whereas in fact, those signals were quite clear coming from the Soviet side. Now, the part of the story that I think is correct is if it was going to come to war, then yes, it's true, Hitler had this military timetable and that effectively gave Stalin even more leverage because Stalin knew that the clock was ticking and that effectively he could kind of ratchet up his own demands. And, and even after the invasion of Poland, the carve up of Poland, the Soviets still have all the leverage, both the economic leverage because Hitler desperately needs Soviet resources, manganese, grain, cotton, oil, et cetera, uh, but also because you know, Hitler is the one at war with the Western powers and Stalin is neutral. Um, so that Stalin effectively can keep ratcheting up his demands knowing that Hitler is really in, in no great position to drive a hard bargain himself because he's, he's under far more strategic pressure than Stalin is. You know, uh, Sean, if you don't mind, I'm gonna read you your own words occasionally in the course of this interview. I always find that you, uh, this sentence struck me uh, talking about the outbreak of World War II in Europe. I think actually you're discussing the Nazi Soviet pact at the moment. There was only one statesman in Europe, you say, who truly relished the prospect of a general war breaking out over Poland, Stalin. Can you comment on that? Well, I think it's, it's clear both in the, the almost gleeful kind of schadenfreude tone of Molotov's speech to the Supreme Soviet. Stalin, of course, often kept his cards a little closer to the vest, um, where he's actually almost mocking um, the enablers, as he calls them, meaning the kind of the socialist, the Labour Party politicians, the people who'd all along talked about collective security. And I mean, Molotov basically sneers at them. You know, he says, like, we'll see what kind of warriors they are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is very much kind of welcoming the outbreak of war um, and quite opportunistically and that the Germans were expecting that the Soviets themselves would actually invade to conquer their fair share, which is actually more than half of Polish territory. I mean, the Soviets actually dithered and delayed because they, they realized that they could play their cards if they played their cards right, they could stay out of the war. That in fact, they keep playing down the fact they have an agreement with the Germans. So they pretend that they're not invading. They don't declare war. They wait a couple of weeks. They wait until September 17th. Um, and even then the kind of the territory swap, they end up giving up some of central Poland because the Germans have gone past the demarcation lines in exchange, they get Lithuania. Um, but yeah, back to your, your point about Stalin relishing this prospect, and it didn't turn out exactly like he wanted. You know, he would have preferred that Britain and France had actually maybe engaged the Germans a little sooner than they did. They, they barely did anything to engage the Germans in September 39. And then the following spring, once the Germans did invade France and the Low Countries, he certainly would have preferred effectively a greater bloodbath. I mean, he would have preferred that it wasn't over in six weeks. You know, he wanted them to weaken each other. Uh, but that said, the prospect of a general war breaking out was absolutely to Stalin's liking. So, so Germany's invasion of Poland uh, was a great victory for Stalin. I'm kind of paraphrasing your argument. I'd like you to comment on it. Since it led the world's you know, great capitalist powers uh, into an all-devouring war with one another, or what, what hopefully would be an all-devouring war with one another, while the lone communist state was sort of able to sit out, sit it out and watch. Is, is, is that about right? No, I think that's right. And, and make these very low cost imperialistic moves, um, both carving up Poland while pretending, of course, not to be at war with Poland, but actually taking a huge chunk of, of, of Eastern Poland and then the three Baltic states, of course, the invasion of Finland, which doesn't turn out quite as well. We could probably get back to that later. And then also these moves into Romania. Um, and that is to say, it, it works out really well for the Soviets, because in a lot of ways, the Germans are the ones doing the work. I mean, they're the ones not only incurring the, uh, the opprobrium and the odium of the West and having to go to war with, with Britain and France and being blockaded, of course, by Britain. Uh, they're the ones that did the, the vast bulk of the damage to the Polish armies, even if the invasion of, of Eastern Poland by the Soviets was, was not, of course, also without bloodshed and skirmishing and, and, and yeah, relatively significant casualties, nothing like was seen on the German side. Um, so it's a, basically, it's a low cost form of kind of empire building, expanding the boundaries of Hanwha, extremely low cost. And they boast about this. The other thing is, they're not that subtle about it. I mean, Molotov keeps going before the Supreme Soviet and it becomes a little bit of a leitmotif of the book and boasting about you know, all the weapons that they seized. Uh, they later boast in Pravda about all the banks they seized and all the property they seized and all the gold and all the money that they basically stole from these countries. Mm -hmm. They're more or less boasting about it. And, and the fact that they basically had, they almost lost nothing in return. That is, they'd incurred a very small loss. So yeah, the Germans are running the risk. The Germans are the ones kind of doing the bulk of the, the hard military work and the Soviets are just kind of, you know, floating along the, the slipstream and, and just picking and choosing the territories that they want, which had been basically assigned to them in the pact until Stalin gets a little bit impatient and frustrated and starts demanding more that had been promised in the pact. And that's, that's about a year later in fall 1940. So would you, you, would, you would call or describe Stalin uh, every bit as much a gangster as, as Hitler, uh, what you call the period of their alliance in, in this book, a gangster pact. And I'm asking, 
um, with regards to a specific event. Why is Stalin's invasion of Finland, you know, an act that was every bit as unprovoked, brutal, and criminal as Hitler's invasion of Poland? We regularly refer to Hitler's invasion of Poland as the launching of a criminal war. Why is Stalin's invasion of Finland not seen in, in, in the same terms as of, of, of opprobrium, as, as you just said? Why has it kind of fallen down our collective memory hole? Well, it's a great question, Rob. I mean, it is a bit of a mystery. There's obviously some selective amnesia here. Um, a large part of what I've done in the book, although I did uncover a lot of new sources, is simply return to the actual sources and discussion at the time to remind everyone that far from the sideshow that it's maybe remembered as today, at the time it was actually kind of the main event because Poland had already been defeated. Um, the Western Allies had not really engaged the Germans. And for a while in the winter of 1939-40, Finland was actually the big story. Uh, the Soviet Union is expelled from the League of Nations, uh, a fate which actually had been avoided by Nazi Germany, Italy, and Japan, the so-called Axis powers, because they had actually resigned from the League first, kind of right. basically saying like, look, we're no longer going to play your game. The Soviets were actually expelled. Um, it was a big deal. Um, they were widely denounced in uh, not just the press of the, of the belligerent powers, but also the neutral powers of the United States, even Roosevelt, who had really been fairly favorable to the Soviets up until 1939-40. Even Roosevelt denounces this invasion, these kind of thundering moral terms. He announces a moral embargo on exports to the Soviet Union. Um, and in fact, there's a big kind of groundswell of opinion developing in a lot of the neutral countries behind intervention. The British discuss it openly. There's a fascinating discussion in the British cabinet as early as uh, November 1939, shortly before the Soviet invasion, where, where they basically point out that so far, there hadn't been this obvious hypocrisy. Why did Britain and France declare war on only one of the powers invading Poland? And that if they did not take a stand against the Soviets in Finland, they thought this might prejudice opinion. They were actually concerned that opinion was really turning more sharply almost against the Soviets than against the Germans. Not everywhere, identically, but in a lot of Europe, a lot of people saw Stalin as uh, an even greater threat or, or Soviet communism as an, even, as an even greater threat. So it's a real mystery. I mean, I think a lot of it is just kind of this amnesia. And then obviously after Barbarossa, everyone just kind of forgets about it. Um, even though Finland, of course, joined Barbarossa on the German side, along with some of the other countries that had been invaded by the Soviets, such as Romania, along with other countries allied to the Axis. Um, there's a kind of amnesia about all this. I suppose Barbarossa just kind of swallows everything up and then people tend to forget a lot of, of what happened beforehand. Let me um, ask a, a similar question and just ask you to comment about the Katyn Forest Massacre. This is a horrendous event, which saw the NKVD and probably Red Army units taking part as well, shooting thousands of Polish officers who had fallen into uh, Soviet hands as, as uh, POWs after that brief campaign in September 1939. It seems to barely exist in our historical consciousness today. I regularly bumped into students, even who knew the, were their World War II pretty well, who thought the Nazis had done it, which of course is the original propaganda claim from the Soviet Union, which still seems to live on. Of course, the Nazis are capable of almost anything, mass murder on an unheard of scale. So it seems plausible enough. But of course, this was another, uh, this was another act of our, of our ally in World War II, Joseph Stalin. Well, it is funny the way historical memory works. There was a time in the late 80s and early 90s, kind of the time of perestroika, glasnost, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the opening of the archives, where there was some real reckoning both in Russia about responsibility for the Katyn Forest Massacre. And, and also in the West, there was more discussion of it, which really had been kind of suppressed. It was a, a contentious subject during the Cold War. The official Soviet claim remained that it had been, not just that the Nazis had done it, but that it had actually taken place in a different year. They said it took place in 1941. And in Poland, uh, simply reminding everyone that this took place in 1940 was a little bit of a kind of a political call to arms. And, and I remember hearing about this when I was growing up and when I was a student, but it's true, it kind of vanished again a little bit from the conversation. And curiously enough, in Russia, uh, once again, books are kind of coming out, which now either deny responsibility or evade responsibility or just kind of push it to the side and ignore the fact that, that the, Rush, the Russians had finally taken responsibility. But as for why I think it's significant, I mean, if you go back to when it happens, and the orders first given on, on March 5th, 1940, and then most of it carried, is carried out in April, not actually in the forest, but mostly in these cities where they first rounded up all these Polish officers and elites from, from labor camps to which they had been deported after the Soviet invasion of Poland. Um, the context is that Stalin at the time was concerned um, that the allies were gonna intervene against him in Finland, but also possibly bomb the oil fields, the Caspian oil fields at, at Baku. Um, Polish pilots were actually training in, in the RAF. Uh, there are a lot of Polish 
uh, soldiers, regular army, who were also training to perhaps join expeditionary forces being sent to either Finland. And there was even some talk of airdrops in, into Transcaucasian or the Soviet Caucasus. Stalin had the superlative spy network. So he heard about all of these plots and plans. And again, maybe he exaggerated them in the way that his paranoia would always kind of come to the fore. Um, but it wasn't totally sensible to think that something like this might happen. Um, and what I try to explain in the book is both first that this is why he makes such an early peace with Finland, kind of surprising everyone, but also why he carried out this, this preemptive, from his perspective, massacre. And, and in fact, for years after it, the Soviets not only denied it, no one knew what had happened to the officers. I mean, it really was this kind of secret crime. I mean, a really devastating one. A couple of years later, uh, Poland's exile government in London, they tried to get uh, Churchill and the British to help organize and support a Polish army formed among the former uh, labor camp prisoners and inmates in, in Russia. And they're not actually sure what's happened to all of those officers. Um, in fact, they're hoping that that officer corps will actually be able to lead the army. They don't know that nearly all of them are dead. I mean, it's, it's a really a, astonishing crime that, as you're pointing out, it's just amazing that we don't hear more about it or really know more about it. I, I felt the in, in many ways, the most stimulating parts of, of the book, Sean, over the early war period, 39 to, to 41, uh, when everything seems to be in flux. But, but at least from the Soviet perspective, this is a period when Stalin's Soviet Union was invading uh, its neighbors, seizing territory, slaughtering political prisoners and prisoners of war in the tens or perhaps even the hundreds of thousands. How, how close did the Western powers actually come to declaring war on the Soviet Union in this period? You do speak of uh, the uh, the uh, British were doing RAF were doing reconnaissance flights over over Baku and, and over the Caspian oil fields. It, it's a it's almost sounds like uh, it, it's a uh, man in the high castle. It seems to diverge so much from the reality that we know. How how close did the Soviets come to pulling? Or excuse me, the British and French come to pulling the trigger yeah. over Finland, for example. Well, yeah, I mean, it's true. Some of the reviewers of the books have, have sort of posited this as some sort of counterfactual that I proposed. Um, and there might be a little bit of a discussion of just kind of what might have happened, but that's not really what the book is mostly about in this period. It's mostly about what nearly happened and how that impacted Stalin's decision making, uh, which is, you know, a, a way of saying that I do think they came close. They maybe didn't come quite as close as Stalin thought they were coming, but that part of what he was doing was trying to preempt them from doing so. But in fact, if you look at the staff discussions, the talks, not just did they carry out these overflights, but they sent uh, four squadrons of Blenheim bombers to Kabania, this, this base in northern Iraq, so that they actually had the bombers in place. They had done the studies. They had some rough estimates on how long they thought the bombing campaign would take. They'd taken the photographs of the oil derricks and some of the refineries. So they had a rough idea of kind of how evenly spaced out they were, how accurate the bombers would have to be, which is to say not especially accurate. They thought they could kind of almost saturation bomb the area and create a giant conflagration. We know that Stalin actually instigated queries at the US Embassy in Moscow, among other places, about the likely damage of such a bombing campaign. So he took this really deathly seriously. Um, now, as far as the planning for deployment to Finland, part of the issue there was that Churchill himself favored uh, what they called Operation Catherine, more or less what they eventually tried to do in Norway. And some of it was because of uh, basically the waters off the coast of Norway being somewhat more not, not ideal, of course, in, in the conditions of March and April, but a little bit kind of safer and, and less perilous than the Barren Sea further north, where you would have actually had to carry out an occupation potentially of Pitsamo uh, in northern Finland. But part of the reason the Allies got so close to this is because it wasn't just the oil they were thinking about. Oil, which was both fueling, of course, Stalin's war machine, but also Hitler's, because so much of it is being sent to, to Germany by way of, of Soviet uh, kind of territory and, of course, railways and logistics, but also because of the nickel produced. Uh, everyone knows about the iron ore, the uh, the kind of the Galavere mines, the imports to Scandinavia in terms of, of a lot of the, the metals that Nazi Germany required on. But the nickel was actually particularly important in the production of panzers. And that, that's what the Germans and Soviets were sort of focused on in, in northern Finland at Pitsamon. The Soviets actually did occupy that town, which was also alarming to the Germans. Um, so they did carry out a lot of the planning and the surveillance. The French, and a little bit has to do with the, the perils, I suppose, of, of coalition warfare. The French were much, much more enthusiastic. They were, in general, a little more anti-Soviet than the British were. They also were a little more keen, shall we say, to make sure the fighting didn't happen in France this time. Um, Whereas the British, in part because they were the ones who would have to carry out, I think, a lot of the logistical work. Um, and Churchill at the time was still uh, first Lord of the Admiralty. He hadn't ascended to the premiership yet, to, to being prime minister. 
And so I think some of Churchill's concerns about the dangers of the mission and, and the fact that Churchill, and we can return to this later, Churchill was simply not as vociferously anti-Soviet as really the French were and even some of the other members of the British cabinet were, that might have militated against uh, the realistic prospect of, mm -hmm. of intervention. But that said, they were very far along in the discussions and even after Stalin uh, signs his armistice with, with Finland, the discussion continued. In fact, the British sent Fitzroy McLean, this kind of all purpose jack of all trades, member of the House of Commons, part-time spy, former diplomat. Uh, they were actually sending him to Damascus to talk with Weygand and, and the French command in the Middle East about operations in the Caucasus. They sent him to Paris just several days before the Germans invaded France and the Low Countries. And his mission was called off literally because of that invasion. Uh, so I think a lot of it was memory hold. Um, it was a little bit embarrassing to think about and talk about uh, afterwards. Um, but I do think they came much closer than is commonly realized. Right, thank you. Let's uh, shift gears to the big one. Uh, this is the day after the 80th anniversary, of course, of a major event in world history, and it's the German invasion of the Soviet Union, Operation Barbarossa. Um, the whole world changed, the whole war changed, our uh, history changed. Uh, it's not, cons not considered Stalin's finest hour, um, frankly. How surprised was he by the German invasion? You know, as you know, Sean, the popular lore has him going into kind of seclusion and I don't know, drinking tumblerfuls of vodka and, and, and suffering a kind of breakdown. Is, is any of that true or has a certain mythology been attached to that? Well, I think kind of there, there are bits and pieces of truth in it. Um, obviously, he did feel betrayed by Hitler, I think, for obvious reasons. They had to have this pact for several years. Um, there are signs, certainly, that about a week after the invasion, there's this kind of famous tirade, and we have several sources for this, when he does briefly kind of retire to his dacha. There is the fact that he didn't address uh, the nation by radio in the hours after the invasion. He left out to Molotov whether that was because he'd been drinking or he wasn't up to it or he preferred that Molotov take the blame, it's not entirely clear. Uh, but the idea that, again, he just sunk into this kind of despondent funk and disappeared after the invasion, we now know that to be untrue because we have the Kremlin logbooks. Uh, we have the, what are called the kind of the special files of the Politburo showing the resolutions that were passed in the early days, the creation of uh, GKO, the State Defense Committee, uh, some of the revolutions even having to do with specific military pr procurement uh, tank and warplane production. A lot of them not only have Stalin's signature on several of them, he's actually the sole signatory. You know, we know kind of who he was meeting with, roughly how long they met. Uh, we know that he did uh, change. There had been this somewhat uh, confusing order the night before the invasion, basically ordering everyone up to kind of readiness, but without giving them clear orders regarding the rules of engagement, where it did seem like at the last minute he was trying to make clear that they shouldn't fire first. Uh, both not to give provocation and obviously not to not to let the Soviets have any share in sort of the guilt or responsibility for the outbreak of the war. Uh, but again, the idea that this is this kind of bolt from the blue, that the Soviets were this kind of peace loving country that was just attacked without warning or preparation. Uh, there have been dozens of warnings. I mean, it wasn't just the British and American attaches and Churchill had been sharing intelligence. The Soviets had their own sources. You know, they had people coming across the lines. Um, they, they had a rough idea of kind of what was coming. Uh, I think part of the reason why it did take them aback, not unawares, but again, they, were, they obviously were unprepared and it's an utter debacle what happens in the frontier battles, really the first two or three weeks. It's just a, a catastrophe of, of almost biblical proportions what happens to the Red Armies. Um, part of the reason for that is that the Germans really were quite rapid in their preparations. While there had been a lot of kind of, you know, warning shots and a lot of intelligence reports, a lot of the military preparations really had just been speeded up almost to warp speed in the last couple of weeks. Um, so that yes, they knew something was coming, but by the time we're a couple of days away, there's this, this sense of almost dread, I think, in the Soviet high command. This is the one thing I discovered, which I think is a little bit new, um, aside from the procurement and the deployment, I did find some of, of, of my own material there. But I think the thing that I found most interesting about both the Soviet deployment pattern, but then also the kind of the last minute, almost creeping sense of dread or panic, is that all those new aerodromes or air bases and tank parks and petrol stations they're building in the newly occupied frontier districts, really, that the territories occupied since 1939, abutting the German Reich, so right on the frontier. At the last minute, they, they, the issue is these almost panicky orders. You, you have to start camouflaging them. You have to start building dummy aerodromes and dummy bombers, dummy warplanes and dummy tanks. And, and the target dates for those kind of maskirovka, those, those camouflage operations come either July 5th or July 15th or a little bit later in July. 
Uh, so they kind of knew what was coming, but they still weren't prepared and they were kind of caught, not necessarily in a mid mobilization, in the sense that they were actively mobilizing uh, for campaign, but they were shifting massive amounts of resources to the frontier, a lot of which was quite vulnerable uncamouflaged, you know, a lot of the air bases didn't even have roofs. Um, and this actually matches what we know about the early hours of the invasion, which was, it was almost like this turkey shoot where the Germans are just knocking out all these warplanes on the ground. Again, they're, they're there. There aren't even roofs in a lot of cases. There's still construction crews hard at work, you know, hammering and jackhammering away. So the Germans could practically hear them. Um, so it, it turns into just a, an utter catastrophe. Um, you said a, uh, almost biblical proportions, you, you put it. And I think in some Somewhere I have written that exact phrase to talk about what happened to the Red Army in the opening yeah. weeks of Operation Barbarossa. Uh, how close did the Germans come to conquering the Soviet Union in that first campaign? And I, I ask, because as I'm sure you know, Sean, historians have been arguing about this one a lot lately. Yeah. I think any campaign where you get to the outskirts of your enemy's capital, and it's Moscow, you, you know, you came pretty close. So uh, David Stahl, who's a very bright uh, writer, uh, an author on, on Operation Barbarossa and the Eastern Front, thinks that uh, well, you know, by that time, the Germans had shot their boats so badly, they had zero chance. He, in fact, he thinks campaign fell apart pretty early on uh, and, and was destined to defeat a long time before December. I just wonder where you'd put yourself on that spectrum. Well, I mean, Stahl's work is interesting. He, he obviously knows the German source is cold. You know? And so I think if you look at this from the German perspective, you can see all kinds of shortcomings, shortages of this, shortages of that. They obviously don't have enough mechanized armor. They don't have enough trucks. They don't have enough kind of lorries, supply vehicles. They're struggling to double track the rail lines. They're all things you can point to saying the Germans are practically at, their, at the end of their tether by the time they get to Moscow. And I don't think that's necessarily untrue. Um, I think that the problem with Steinhal's work, and again, it's very good, I think, insofar as it goes, um, but he doesn't look at the other side very closely, which is to say, yes, the Germans were exhausted. They might have been at the end of their rope. And I mean, that's why I like this metaphor. I think it was probably David Glances, that it's a little bit like these kind of punch drunk boxers who can barely stand. And the Battle of Moscow is a bit like that. You know, it's not really this heroic, vigorous engagement. I think the part of the story that has been missed, in part because, well, there are reasons that the Russians have been concealing a lot of this information for, for all of these decades. And even today, it's very difficult to kind of get it out of them, to get it out of the archives and to piece the story together. Is just how badly they were actually losing what the Germans called the Materialschlacht, which is to say, yes, the Germans had always been short of some of these things. The Russians initially were very rich in these things, but they'd lost nearly all of them. I mean, they had lost something like 70, 80, 90% of many of their key resources, if you're talking about the tank park, if you're talking about the warplanes. And they're not replacing them at anywhere near that speed. In a lot of categories, they're barely making up a quarter of losses, that is, with, with the production. You know, so the production of things like the T-34 tank or the KV, they're, they're all plummeting in 1941 for the obvious reason that the Germans are conquering this territory. Now, it's true that in the short run, the Germans don't benefit that much because, of course, there's a lot of damage and sabotage and scorched earth. Not as much as this sometimes been claimed. I did discover, you know, they did actually capture a lot of factories intact. I mean, to give you one example, which is maybe a little bit less obvious than when it comes to kind of mechanized armor, the entire Red Army kind of uniform and boot supply complex, which is nearly all, all based in the Baltic area, was completely taken over by the Germans. That's one of the reasons why, you know, the Red Army simply in order to clothe its soldiers and, of course, feed them and supply them with boots and also eventually a lot of weapons and ammunition, they have to end up relying on, on the lend lease aid from the Western mm -hmm. powers. But as far as how close the Germans come, you know, again, not to conquering all of the Soviet Union, no. Um, I mean, even in kind of the most ideal conception, I don't think uh, Hitler and his generals expected to do more than maybe reach the Volga River, really, by the time the snows came. They obviously didn't quite make it that far. They didn't quite make it to Moscow. Uh, but that said, again, the idea that that the Germans were fated to lose. This would have obviously come as news to all of the Allied ambassadors and journalists and all the Russians who are fleeing Moscow in October 1941 when the city is evacuated. Uh, I mean, I think it was a very close run thing just as far as morale. And I do think Stalin's decision, which was kind of a last minute one, to stay in the city, I think was hugely important, both symbolically, but also in terms of kind of communications and command, the Zhukov and, and Stalin, and in the end, some of their key kind of Politburo uh, advisors and allies, that they stayed in the city, whereas in fact, nearly everyone else had evacuated. I do think that mattered. 
Um, but that said, it was a close run thing. I think it was, I, I come down more on, on the side of the debate that it's a close run thing. That said, I don't know what the Germans would have been able to do next. That, uh, had they conquered Moscow, maybe there would have been a coup, maybe Stalin's regime, Stalin might have found himself you know, scapegoated, strung up. It's hard to know what would have transpired. But they wouldn't have been able to subdue the rest of the Soviet Union. They, they obviously had no logistical capacity uh, to do that in 1941. So for the rest of the war now, Stalin's a key ally of, of, uh, in the war against Germany uh, because Germany declares war on the United States and now it's one gigantic global conflagration. Um, the, the West uh, Im immediately sort of completely does a 180 on its views of Joseph Stalin. He's no longer the thug and the gangster and the murdering dictator and the psychotic. He's now a loyal ally. We spend the rest of the war, as you put it, trying to keep Stalin happy, uh, the title of, of one of your chapters. We begin pouring in Len Lease, which even in, in Western histories, uh, from my reading of your book, most Western histories underplay the importance of, of Len Lease. They talk about beans when you're talking about a trillion dollars worth of, of material and technology uh, transfer. Um, did, did Stalin sort of take advantage of the Allies during this war? I mean, it's a big theme of the book, and I, I know it's probably large to ask all in one question. But t tell me about how important, I guess, Western support was, Len Lease, for example, to the Soviet victory. Well, I, I think Stalin absolutely took advantage. I think he was initially a bit surprised by it, in fact. Like he did expect, maybe he wasn't surprised that Churchill and Roosevelt came out with these kind of symbolic declarations of support. I mean, in, in a way, the initial public relations miracle is not very hard to explain. The Germans invade the Soviet Union. It's a brutal invasion. You know, they're, they're known to be obviously merciless when it comes to invading other countries. People didn't know the full story yet about the death camps and the Holocaust, of course. But with the brutal reputation of the Nazi regime, obviously the natural inclination of people in Britain and the United States was to sympathize. I don't think Stalin necessarily expected, though, let's say for Churchill to reroute those uh, 200 Hawker Hurricane fighters, which have been pledged to defend Singapore. And he just gifts them basically to Stalin, or he starts almost re-gifting or re-consigning even a lot of the Lend-Lease consignments, which had been a promise to Britain in 1942 before Stalingrad. They actually ship a lot of tanks up basically from Middle Eastern command, thus stripping Egypt of defenses. You know, Churchill, despite his reputation as this arch imperialist, in fact, very consciously chooses to, to favor Stalin and, and the Soviet army and its needs over that of the British Empire, which in retrospect, I think is, is both kind of interesting and a little bit surprising. Now the US, because of its vast wealth and the kind of almost hydraulic potential of the US economy, it was maybe not quite perhaps as dramatic as far as depriving itself of resources, although there were cases of that. I mean, I talk about the things like the butter shortages that start to bite in 1943 when all the butter is being shipped to the Soviet Union and Americans are all told they have to make do with oleomargarine, whereas the, the Russians need butter. Uh, I mean, that's just one of many, many cases, but the Americans, they really do go all out. I mean, they reshape the entire pork industry. Uh, you know, so the 13, eventually 50, nearly 20% of pork production is going directly to the Red Army. In terms of some commodities, like sugar, I mean, the, the Russians had no sugar without the Americans, like 70% or something. Um, other resources, things like aluminum, I, I make a big deal about. And this is partly because Stalin himself made a big deal about it. He said quite up front with Hopkins, Churchill, Roosevelt, whomever he talked to, we desperately need the aluminum. The reason they, they needed the aluminum uh, was not just for producing warplanes, which was generally true everywhere, but they actually used it in their tanks. They used it in the T-34 and, and, and the KV tanks and the later Stalin series. So particularly the heavier tanks they needed aluminum for. They couldn't keep the, the weight ratios in order otherwise. Um, so you have all kinds of things like the metals, the non-ferrous metals, refined steel products. Um, you had vast quantities of ammunition and explosives. Uh, again, the inputs and the technology transfer you needed in the Soviet war industry, entire, entire factories uh, involved in things like tire production, uh, rubber, a whole plants are sent to the Soviet Union along with their intellectual property. A lot of kind of the processes involved in oil refining. All of this is sent effectively free of charge. I mean, the Soviets eventually settled at about two pennies on the dollar for, for nearly the lot of it. Um, but there, there are some categories in far as motor vehicles. If you look at things like the, the Jeeps and the Studebakers, um, the lorries, the trucks, um, where the Soviets were utterly dependent on U.S. supplies. And that has a huge part in the story of, of the restoration of mobility, eventually this kind of Soviet march to Berlin, you know, with upwards of 450,000 uh, motorized vehicles. And that doesn't count tanks. It used to be thought that the tanks were kind of, of negligible importance. The Soviets 
they emphasize, oh, but you know, we have the T-34 and we don't like your tanks and their death traps. And you'll still hear people say this. I mean, one reviewer in my book actually tried to make this, oh, but they were death traps. They didn't use it. Yes, in public, that's what they said. In private, they conducted studies and they, they determined, and I found these files actually in the Soviet military archives, that no, in fact, they were fairly impressed. No tank is perfect. They all have certain drawbacks, but they were using the Matildas and the Valentines and the Shermans. And the Americans started custom producing warplanes and tanks just for the Soviet army and its needs. You know, they would make diesels because the Soviets preferred diesels. Um, uh, certain airplanes like the, the Arakobra, the Kobrushka, as the Russians called it, uh, either they end up, or, or the, um, you know, the A-20, uh, the, the Douglas Havoc bomber. Um, you know, they're building more for the Russians than they are for the U.S. Army Air Force. Um, and so they're hugely important in, um, in both uh, the Soviet Air Force, you know, and, and, and the restoration of Soviet mobility. And no, I don't think that the Soviets might have survived in some form absent, you know, this massive aid, at least with a little bit of aid. But as far as turning the Red Army into this kind of mobile mechanized striking force that eventually you know, was able to just outclass the Germans when it comes to, you know, whole categories of mechanized armor and, you know, eventually pour into Belarusia, Poland, eventually Central and Eastern Europe and the Balkans and all the way to Berlin. I don't think that happens without this lend lease aid. Let's um, uh, uh, focus in on one character here. And I think it's the one that mo most American readers, at least, are probably going to be most interested in. Assess FDR for us as a wartime leader, especially in terms of managing the, the Soviet alliance. It's customary, and I'll, in a full disclosure, I, I work at the National World War II Museum, where we talk a great deal about Roosevelt's farsighted political leadership, uh, both before and during World War II. Clearly, um, I, I don't want to be a, a flippant here, but clearly you're not a fan, or not as much of a fan of, of FDR's of wartime policy. Uh, I see one question in the Q&A box that uh, said, so does FDR, does FDR come across as kind of gullible? And I wonder if you'd be, be willing to address that. Well, it's a really fascinating question. I mean, I'm, I'm still getting my head around it a little bit myself. That is trying to understand Roosevelt and his thinking. I think you're absolutely right that he was far-sighted. I don't think there's any doubt about that. You can see this in Churchill as well, that at a time when a lot of other people, again, before Barbarossa, were seeing the Soviet Union as this kind of great long-term threat, you know, perhaps not as nefarious as Hitler in, in the kind of the short-run military threat, certainly someone to worry about. I think both Churchill, as early as 1939, sees he almost sees in his head this eventual grand alliance, kind of two years, but there is a vision. Um, and in Roosevelt's case, long before the US enters the war, it's clear that he's ranged himself on, on the side of Britain, trying to support Britain. Of course, his hands are tied by Congress. And so uh, there, there's little he can do other than bases for destroyers and then eventually lend lease um, until of course the US is in the war itself. There is this kind of far-sightedness. I mean, I do think it's a bit selective. It's a little bit one-sided. And there's an element almost of the self-fulfilling prophecy. That is to say, whether it's Roosevelt or Hopkins, they come to see the Soviet Union, not just as a kind of likable protagonist worthy of support, but the great power in the making with whom they want to make friends because after the war, we're going to need the Soviets. Um, and you know, there's an angle in which this is true. Part of the reason it's true though, is it becomes true because they help to make it happen. And that is to say, they make this conscious choice to side not just a little bit, to sympathize with the Soviets, to send them some aid, but to prioritize Russia. And they actually say this as early as the Arcadia declarations of December 41, that in fact, they're not even gonna prioritize Japan, even though Japan attacked the US at Pearl Harbor. It's Germany first. And in addition to that, the priority vis-a-vis -vis Germany is Russia first. That is giving all assistance, all possible assistance to Russia's army. Those are very specific choices. They were not ones necessarily that had public support. And I think where I do tend to be a little more critical of Roosevelt is that let's say in the first five months or so after Barbarossa, Roosevelt and Hopkins and their advisors do determine that the Soviets will be eligible for, and they do begin uh, ramping up the Lend-Lease aid, but they don't own up to this in public. They actually keep it secret. And they actually tell diplomats to kind of clam up about it and not to talk about it in public because they know that it's controversial. Um, the same thing is true, I think, of some of these other policies you know, at the end of the war. The Morgenthau Plan, for example, where Roosevelt kind of denies it and he disowns it when he's forced to kind of take a political hit because of it. Um, he could be quite clever. I mean, you asked if he was gullible, and it's quite interesting because he was capable of such kind of almost Machiavellian realpolitik domestically. I think that's long been understood about Roosevelt. He, he, he had a way of kind of getting his way. He obviously was a tough politician and a very competent one. Vis-a-vis -vis Churchill in the British, he could be quite effective and almost ruthless. I mean, if you actually look at the deals negotiated with Britain from 
bases for destroyers, effectively giving these almost kind of decrepit World War I era destroyers and only 50 of them at that in exchange for these long-term leases and all these British bases. In terms of Lend-Lease and then Lend-Lease phase two, effectively mortgaging the British Empire to the United States, which by the end of, of the war has begun to kind of take over a lot of the infrastructure of the British Empire. He's obviously capable of very effective, realistic statesmanship. The mystery to me is just why he sort of threw all that out the window when it came to Stalin. Again, maybe some of it was sentimental, some of it was this kind of sense of noblesse oblige, oh, well, look, the, the plucky Russians. Yes, they have been the aggressor in Finland, but let's forget about that. Let's just, now, you know, basically they're the victim, and so we're going to side with them, we're going to give them whatever they want. Um, and that's the, the thing about keeping Stalin happy, which I talked about early in the war. I think a lot of these policies are almost impossible to explain unless you understand that dynamic. Unconditional surrender being an obvious example, where if you look at kind of when and why it's announced, and even to some extent how it's announced, Roosevelt actually meant to give this as a sort of a diplomatic surprise gift. He was going to send Marshall to Moscow and sort of reassure Stalin that even though we weren't engaging the Germans very directly yet, we were pledged to kind of... Uh, fight the war to the end. I think there was also an element of almost compensation of Roosevelt trying to keep, you know, to, to convince Stalin that the U.S. was serious. And so it had to do that with both the Lend-Lease aid, with unconditional surrender, and, and with really kind of kowtowing to Stalin's demands in both Europe and Asia, and, and sort of keeping them happy. I think it was very selective. I don't think this means that Roosevelt was, was gullible or naive across the board. I do think vis-a-vis -vis Stalin he was. One last brief question, and then we'll throw it open to our, uh, our, our listeners. They always come up with good questions, and they're doing it right now, uh, Sean. Was Stalin's Soviet Union the real winner of World War II? I mean, you have a chapter in the book called Booty, you know, all the, all the sort of wealth that, that, that Stalin was able to uh, 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 steal from his neighbors and during these victorious campaigns. But um, would you go so far as to say that Stalin's Soviet Union was the real winner? Well, I think so. I mean, obviously, you can't completely gain see the American victory entirely. The U.S. is obviously in a very strong position at the end of the war, effectively inheriting almost the, the old infrastructure and to some extent security commitments of, of the British Empire. And if there was a little bit of reluctance at first to take those up until uh, the Truman Doctrine is announced in early 1947. But the Soviets just objectively, as you're pointing out, I mean, they have, it's not just they conquer territory and they create a satellite empire in Europe. I mean, they literally cart back, they, they do declare are basically the reparations demands of about 10 billion US dollars. Uh, again, pretty close in a lot of ways to the amount of Lend-Lease aid the US gave, which again, I, it's a very crude conversion, but I say that's close to the equivalent of the kind of a trillion dollars in current equivalent. Um, and they get all of this in, in the form of industrial property. They even demand and they get human reparations. They, they make it quite explicit even at Yalta that they're actually going to take reparations in the form of slave labor. So they take property, they take slave labor, they take territory. Uh, in Europe, you could at least say that there was a price they paid, obviously, with the, the horrendous casualties suffered by the Red Army. What's even more remarkable is that in Asia, Stalin gains this new empire. Uh, first Manchuria, although, of course, eventually some of it is kind of re-gifted back once, once China goes communist, but at least in the short run, you know, Stalin carves out this empire in Manchuria, and North Korea, the Korea Islands, Sakhalin, etc., which had actually been promised to him long before the Soviets were in the war. At the time, the Soviets were actually still neutral, not only neutral, they were actually arresting U.S. pilots, landing on Soviet soil after, after bombing raids on Japan. And he gets all this thing, and not, not for free. The Soviets do have to invade. Uh, a lot of the equipment they used and the food and the fuel had actually been gifted to them by the Americans. Um, so that's actually a victory kind of on the cheap. Um, I do think that, yes, objectively, just in terms of territory, booty, conquered, Stalin is clearly, the, almost unquestionably, the great victor of the war. Sean McMeekin talking about his new book, Stalin's War, A New History of, of World War II. Sean, I, uh, I found the discussion as stimulating as, the, as reading the book was, and I recommend this book uh, wholeheartedly to everyone out there. Wonder if you'd be good enough to spend the next 10 minutes with us or so uh, answering questions from our listeners. Um, we have some good ones. Um, here's uh, William Janus, who is an adjunct professor at Fordham uh, Law School. Since Stalin was an opportunist, why did he ignore warnings about Operation Barbarossa and, and, and negotiate some kind of pact with Germany enabling to focus on the West and or Middle East? Could he have enabled a Berlin-Baghdad arrangement like the Germans sought in World War I at the expense of the West and to his benefit? So let's, let's focus on that. Why did Stalin ignore the warnings about Operation Barbarossa? You paint him as, in, in, I wouldn't say Machiavellian, but you paint him as a guy who had his, he, he, all, this, all the strings of power and influence, you know, all gathered around Stalin. He was certainly no dummy, but here he just seems to have taken leave of his senses. Can you address that? 
Well, okay. I mean, there, there are kind of two elements to the question here. I don't think he completely ignored the warnings. I mean, he got massive amounts of warnings and they're just pouring in basically to the Kremlin by June 1941. He didn't disregard them. Uh, he did choose to regard a lot of them as what he kind of saw as disinformation or misinformation. Uh, some of it might have been wishful thinking. That is that he thought in exchange for everything he had given Hitler, that Hitler couldn't possibly actually really go through with it, that maybe he thought Hitler was just trying to bully him. Um, if you go back a little bit further to the Berlin negotiations where Molotov goes to Berlin in November 1940, I mean, here's where I think Stalin actually first really errs. Again, yes, Machiavellian, but by no means flawless. It's not like he was this all-powerful, all-seeing genius. Um, he actually pushed Hitler too far. He not only went past what had been demanded in the Moscow Pact and promised in the Moscow Pact, first by demanding part of Bukovina, which had not been listed in the Moscow Pact, but then in exchange for that, the Germans had asked for something of a protectorate in Romania so they could control the oil resources. Um, Stalin asked that they leave Romania. They take all their military personnel out of Romania. He asked that they evacuate all their personnel from Finland. He asked for the right to invade Bulgaria, the right to garrison troops at the Turkish Straits. I don't know if that's what you were getting at with this Berlin to Baghdad idea, but this actually is what Stalin was trying to do. He was actually car trying to carve out this sort of Near Eastern Empire, which would really leave Hitler almost entirely at his mercy. Um, because he controls so many, not just, again, the oil and the nickel, but you're talking about chrome in particular, which is all coming in from Turkey and the Balkans. Um, so as far as, you know, I, was he, I don't think he was naive. I do think he was capable of hubris. Um, and I think there was an element of hubris both in these demands that he made. And then, again, he didn't ignore the warnings. Um, he was a little bit hesitant in acting on them. Right before the invasion begins, he does issue these orders, ordering the troops up to combat readiness. I mean, they're canceling furloughs. They're, they're absolutely not kind of completely unprepared on the border. Um, they're just not fully prepared in the sense that they had not really arranged for a strategic defense. I think that's the real problem is that Stalin was planning for a different type of war. Um, and in the end, you know, Hitler just sort of beat him to the punch long before uh, Stalin was ready. Some of it was just, again, the, uh, the great speed with which the Germans prepared in advance so that even though the Russians saw it coming, they still weren't ready. Uh, here's, uh, I would say, the classical $64,000 question, and I'm sure you've been getting this question uh, from, from other people. This is Pamela Myers who asks, how upset or resentful should we be in view of the fact that the Russians, Soviets, did most of the dying in World War II as well as the killing and killing of Germans, that, that is. I wonder if you'd be willing to address that because I'm sure it's, it is the reaction some people have when they read your book. Oh, sure. When it comes to lend -lease, let's say if I'm talking about, you know, the pork, uh, the pork and uh, the fish products and the crab and the butter. And they talked about this at the time, right? I mean, basically, these Americans did complain at the time. And they said, why are we being forced to do without butter? And we're giving all to the Russians, for example. Uh, and the answer is, well, look, they need it because they are the ones doing the fighting and the dying and all the rest of it. Um, I mean, there, I think there are several different angles of interest here. Um, you're absolutely right that, you know, if again, the objective in the war is to defeat Nazi Germany at all costs, the Russians are doing, at least between 1941 and, and D-Day, certainly, they're doing the vast bulk of the fight. Now, not all of it. I mean, the, the Allies are fighting the Germans in North Africa. They eventually do invade Italy. They don't get any credit or thanks for it from the Russians in 1943. They are conducting, of course, these very risky bombing raids. They could, here's where I do begin to kind of differ to this as far as strategic choices. Um, it's not that we shouldn't have, let's say, gratitude for the sacrifices of the Russians. Rather, I think that other choices could have been made. That whether the Allies could have chosen to invade Europe sooner, possibly via the kind of Adriatic stratagem I discussed, or even possibly via France, um, did they have to delay D-Day for so long, partly because they were continuing to provision the Russian army so massively. Uh, the, you know, the argument you sometimes hear from the Russians is actually, oh, well, look, this was all cynical. You were just using us as cannon fodder. Um, and there's an element of truth to that insofar as I do think both Roosevelt and Churchill thought, look, we'd rather preserve our own lives, let the Russians, let the Russians die. Um, I do get that argument and, and I get it a lot. Um, the one thing I have to say though is particularly when I get it from the Russians, um, and particularly when they complain, as they always do about the second front, Stalin began this and the complaint has never ceased. You know, there are two counters to that. One is, what about Japan? Uh, why were the Soviets effectively collaborating with Japan for four years while the Americans were dying against Japan? Not only collaborating, the, the Russians are literally arresting U.S. pilots and interning them as prisoners of war in Asia. Uh, for, for basically for four years. So that's, that's beyond neutrality. That's almost like effective collaboration with Japan. In addition to this, there's no reciprocity. 
Uh, this is true even before Barbarossa, when let's say at the time when Hitler was invading France and the Low Countries, Stalin is not just effectively allied to him, he's literally fueling the Wehrmacht. He's giving them the fuel with which they attack France and the Low Countries. You know, Churchill did not have to turn around after that and say, look, I'm going to sacrifice our interests in Singapore, Egypt, and around the empire because we're so desperate to help the Russians. Uh, I think the Russians are the ones who should have a little bit of gratitude. And I don't know how many, how much time people spend in Russia, but over there, it's as if the US and Britain didn't even fight in the Second World War. Uh, we're just basically ignored in a lot of the celebrations over there. There's, there's a lack of gratitude. They've even closed down the Lend-Lease Museum in Moscow, which actually they had one until a couple of years ago. It's now been shut down and they don't want to hear about it. They don't want to talk about it. And they don't want you to go into the archives to research it either because it uh, is not a story that uh, that really favors uh, favors the, the narrative that the Russians prefer about the war. So many questions I would uh, like to ask and still some out there, but but one one process question, which I always like to ask at least one. Um, Susan Eikenberry, I'm curious, she says, about the archives in Russia particularly. How accessible are they at this point? And is there material yet to be discovered or have the archives been pretty well mined? Sean? Difficult question, in part because I haven't been back for two years and I'm not actually sure what the current state of play is. Uh, since the pandemic, of course, I haven't been back and things were already starting to close up just a bit beforehand. Things were getting a little stricter regarding even things like visa access. Archives run by the Russian government itself are a little bit different from the ones run by the archive ministry. It's a bit confusing as far as the semantics. But for example, the, the foreign ministry archive and the Soviet military archive, the one that goes back to 1941, uh, those, particularly the military archive, are almost impossible now for Western researchers uh, to get into. Um, the ones such as the Communist Party archive where they have the Stalin phone, um, uh, some of the archives that I used uh, on the military before 1941, the Russian government economics archive, GARF, the so-called kind of state archive of the Russian Federation, those are reasonably open but with limits. Even some of the documents that they let you see there are kind of things that get blacked out. And I'm assuming that in the current environment, you'll get to see a little bit more of that. Now, as far as is there more to discover, I think there is always more to discover. Um, one of my frustrations with the foreign, foreign ministry and the military archives is that I like to go to an archive and do my own work and try to find my own material. Uh, and those archives, they just give you whatever they feel like giving you, uh, which is to say you probably won't discover a lot. So it depends on the archive. It depends on how stubborn you are. Sometimes it depends on how much help they either give you or don't give you. Um, but I think there's always more to discover. I mean, an example is with, let's say, the Stalin Churchill Roosevelt correspondence. Sure, a lot of it has been published. A lot of it is in English. There are new compilations and collections. But that said, there's still some material you'll find if you go there. You'll see some of the real-time telegrams, for example. Uh, real-time telegrams between Stalin and Molotov in Berlin in November 1940, things like that, that you simply will not find in the document collection. So yes, I do think there's still more to discover and it is worth going so long as you're willing to put in the legwork and, and put up with a lot of hassle. Sean, the final paragraph of your book, the ultimate price of victory you write was paid by the tens of millions of involuntary subjects of Stalin's satellite regimes in Europe and Asia, including Maoist China, along with the millions of Soviet dissidents returned Soviet POWs and captured war prisoners who were herded into gulag camps on the Arctic gold and platinum mines of Vorkuta to the open air uranium strip mines of Stavropol and Siberia. Would you like to have one minute to comment on that at the end? Well, I guess what I'm trying to get at there um, is that we do have a little bit of this idea of the Second World War as a good war. Um, the Russians obviously have their own version of this, where they like to airbrush, airbrush out the parts that they don't like, the parts that don't fit the story. Again, whether it's lend -Lease or the multi birth control pact. Um, and sure, there is an element in which if you look at Western Europe, the US and Britain, even though Britain obviously was still struggling uh, economically for a long time after the war with rationing and so on, there is still this great sense of relief and oh, finally the war is over and everyone can celebrate. And you know, you have these, these big, obviously, parades, victory parades. Uh, you have a lot of the, the famous kind of pictures of allied soldiers kissing, you know, kissing French beauties and that sort of thing. There's this kind of element where it's a celebration of this great victory, uh, the war with a kind of a, with a reasonably happy conclusion, obviously the freeing of the remaining survivors of uh, some of the, the death camps in Germany, the ending of the Holocaust. Obviously there's a lot of positive that comes out of 1945, um, but I don't think we usually pay attention to those for whom the war didn't end in 1945, nor the suffering. 
uh, that for those who were kind of trapped, whether in these labor camps or simply uh, being occupied by a hostile regime, which kept surveillance and censored and, and kept everyone basically on, on kind of watch lists, the war didn't really end in 1945 and it didn't really have a happy ending. And I just think it's important to remind people of that. Sean McMeekin, a professor of history at Bard College and the author of Stalin's War, A New History of World War II. Sean, I want to thank you for the conversations. Uh, we, it could have gone on for another half hour. We have plenty of, to say and there's plenty of questions left. Um, I, I would urge everyone to, to read this book. It's, it's controversial in the best ways. Uh, it's, it's deeply researched and it, it will challenge you to form counter arguments, which of course is what the best history always does. So uh, Sean, thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Rob. It was a great pleasure. Uh, Rob Satino here signing off from the National World War II Museum in beautiful New Orleans, Louisiana. Thank you very much.